Good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Zeldis, a professor of economics at, here at Columbia Business School and co-director of the Richmond Center for Business Law and Public Policy. The Richmond Center is a joint venture of Columbia's business and law schools, and our mission is to enhance research and develop and promote evidence-based public policy on topics at the intersection of business and law. Dialogue and debate among academics, industry professionals, and policymakers is an important part of this process. I'm very happy that you can join us this evening for this event titled COVID Vaccines, Policies to End This Pandemic and Avoid Another One. It's very moving these days to walk outside in New York and feel the relief in the air as the pandemic eases, knowing that the vaccine is here and effective in an abundant supply in the, in the United States, resulting in conditions here that are so dramatically better than they have been at other times over the last 15 months. But also we know all too well that many in our city were hit disproportionately and that there will be continuing reverberations throughout our recovery. Additionally, there are still large segments of the US population not vaccinated. Vaccines are in very short supply globally with many countries only beginning the vaccination process. And there's the ongoing threat of new variants. So we organized this event to shed light on important policy questions moving forward. We brought together some of Columbia's leading experts on the vaccine, presenting perspectives from medicine, economics, and public health. I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us tonight and for their important work throughout this pandemic. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ashley Swanson, who will be the moderator for this evening's event. And she will introduce the speakers in turn. Ashley is an assistant professor of economics here at Columbia Business School and an expert on the economics of healthcare. In particular, she studies the industrial organization of healthcare, including the interactions between hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, physicians, and patients. Thank you all for joining us. And now I'll turn it over to Ashley. Uh, let me second Steve and thanking everybody for joining us. I'm very excited to hear what our three distinguished speakers have to say uh, about the global vaccine campaign today and uh, the potential role for uh, policy to uh, fight the pandemic and prevent the next one. I'll uh, kick it right over to our speakers. Um, our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Magdalena Sobieszczyk. Uh, she's the Harold C. Noy Professor of Infectious Diseases in Medicine and uh, the Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at the Columbia University's Irving Medical Center. She's a clinical virologist and has studied not only the science of infections like HIV and COVID-19, but also issues at the intersection of infectious disease science and the social sciences like disparities in access to healthcare and prevention. Uh, Magdalena, I'll uh, let you get started. Great, um, thank you, Ashley. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my um, slides with you just to kind of frame some of the key issues that I wanted to review and then hopefully we'll prompt a lot of um, questions and discussion afterwards. Um, so what I wanted um, just to talk to you about um, this evening is the um, SARS-CoV-2 variants and how, um, how they impact um, just our ability to um, control this pandemic um, and um, uh, kind of potentially threaten effectiveness um, of um, currently available vaccines. So I don't, you know, I'm showing this slide here, just kind of reviewing very briefly um, the US centric um, daily trends in COVID-19 cases as are reported to the CDC, but clearly as you can, as we all know, and we're experiencing this, um, there's been a, a decline in the, um, in the seven day average um, cases that are being reported to the CDC, kind of a stark decline compared to what we experienced in January. Um, and much of it um, is thanks to, of course, um, kind of a lot of public health campaigns, social distancing, masking, um, as well as deployment of vaccines. And what I'm showing you here is just a map um, uh, adapted from the from the New York Times that shows uh, uh, both kind of the global SARS-CoV-2 hotspots and vaccine coverage. Um, now looking at it globally, um, as of um, last December, there have been more than um, two billion vaccine doses that have been administered. But there are of course stark gaps 
uh, between um, vaccination programs in different countries. And as you can sort of see, you know, the areas where the hotspots exist um, don't necessarily have the coverage um, with vaccination programs. So for example, in the US, well, we have, you know, close to a half or over half of the population above the age of 12 that's fully vaccinated and a nice proportion of individuals of, above the age of 65 in Brazil and Argentina, uh, which are in, in other parts of Latin America and South America, which are experiencing um, surges in cases that vaccine coverage is quite different. Um, in the United States, if we kind of zoom in a little bit, the current pace of um, vaccine coverage of vaccination also differs by state. So those disparities exist locally as well. Um, and we know that there are many you know, reasons why eligible people may not be vaccinated. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot of work being done in those areas. You know, we know that some experts sort of estimate that we need around 70 to 90% of the total population both adults and children um, covered um, uh, with either vaccine or, or, or immunity naturally acquired in order to kind of to decrease the transmission of the virus and get a control of the, of the pandemic. Um, a number of act factors will kind of determine how quickly we get to that threshold, but certainly presence of more transmissible viruses um, and viral variants can complicate that progress. Um, so what are these um, SARS-CoV-2 variants? Um, it's really sort of a, a kind of a, a natural occurrence um, in terms of the kind of viral um, evolution and viral replication. And a number of these um, viral variants have occurred um, during the course of this pandemic. And they are really sort of a natural consequence of viral replication and, and mutations and errors that arise during viral replication. In the course of the pandemic, what's been really very nicely defined by the WHO and the CDC are these variants of concern and variants of um, interest. Um, so variants of concern are essentially sort of viruses that may, that appear to be either more infectious or cause more severe disease than other circulating coronaviruses. And they may be associated with decrease in effectiveness of, uh, of some of the vaccines. And then um, variants of interest, um, just to kind of um, define our thinking is our very, uh, isolates and viruses that have certain mutations that may lead to um, community transmissions, um, clusters of cases, and may be detected epidemiologically in multiple countries. So those are sort of variants that are carefully um, watched. Um, and um, the CDC, um, as well as the WHO, have sort of kind of la launched, uh, the CDC and, and, and other countries have launched sort of um, the campaigns to sequence, um, sort of conduct genomic sur surveillance and, and sequencing of these um, of viruses that are circulating in order to really very kind of clearly define the epidemiological um, uh, sort of um, uh, patterns of these variants of concerns. And I'm just summarizing some of them here and um, highlighting the ones that have garnered the most attention, um, B117, B1351, and P1 variants that have, have um, been first isolated in the UK, South Africa, and then Japan and Brazil, respectively. I should mention that these um, variants of um, concern and variants of interest have sort of have recently sort of gotten a kind of a, uh, have been renamed uh, by the WHO in order to sort of try to kind of attempt to get a little bit more um, a mainstream um, naming and nomenclature uh, that's more uh, friendly to the public and, 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 and as well as sort of uh, to the press. So I'll, I'll be using some of these names interchangeably um, during, the, during our talk, but the ones that I'm highlighting here are in red are the variants of, of concern uh, that have been first isolated in the countries that I mentioned earlier. The most recent one, the, the Delta or B1617.2 is the one that's um, been first noted in India in October of last year and has been really responsible for kind of this great surge of cases in India. And uh, since then it has um, spread to other parts of the world also, which just sort of highlights the, um, the kind of the um, uh, greater transmission potential of these variants. In terms of um, just kind of taking a look at, the, at what's happening in the US with the uh, the spread of this variance, and this is again kind of highlighting the fact that the CDC has increased the genomic surveillance as they track the prevalence um, of these um, 
um, of these different lineages in order to really kind of um, flag any concerning trends. So here in the US, these are data that lag a little bit about two, we're two weeks behind in terms of the reporting and the sequencing, but the most common lineages are the, the um, B117 isolated from UK or the alpha uh, variant um, and then B1526 um, is one that was first isolated in New York, um, and they are they've been rising in in prevalence um, over the last several uh, months. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, these um, variants are sort of you know as they're epidemiologically sort of um, uh, kind of more common or less common um, in in different in different parts of the of parts of the country, and their prevalence varies um, geographically. Um, for example, in um, New York State, um, the proportion of the B117 variant is close to 60%, um, which is um, similar to uh, what's been noted in um, in California, for example. Um, there are other variants of concern, such as um, the P3 variant that was first isolated in Brazil, which is quite still rare in, in New York, but is more common and frequently noted in California. So there are important regional um, differences that are noted. Um, just taking a little bit, um, quick look at what's been happening in the UK um, with this Delta variant, um, which is um, the one that's been isolated initially in, in England, in, in, in India. Um, it's been, there's a, this is a recent report, um, a technical briefing um, that was uh, presented at the WHO just a couple of weeks ago really sort of reveals that most recent data shows that over 70% of the sequent cases are due to the, um, to the Delta variant, which now took over and replaced almost completely that initial alpha or B117 variant in majority of England. The concerning thing about this variant is that it's potentially more transmissible um, and early data suggests that it has, carries a higher risk of hospitalization, but again, more data are needed to really substantiate this, uh, but again, something that is being watched very carefully. So then the question on everybody's mind is, do these mutations and these variants have an impact on vaccine-induced protection? Um, and does the, you know, as the, as the spike protein um, accumulates more mutations, does it escape from under the um, vaccine protection or monoclonal antibody protection in the case of treatment or prevention um, through passive immunization? And there are some um, actually reassuring data from real world experience um, from UK again, where um, as I just showed to you earlier, this Delta variant has been predominating. So this um, early data, but real world um, effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines suggests that um, two doses of either Pfizer BioNTech vaccine or AstraZeneca vaccine do retain effectiveness um, in terms of protecting from, um, from symptomatic um, disease. And I'm showing you data here from a preprint um, that appeared. This is now peer reviewed. Um, so again, we have to await a final publication, but it does suggest again that you know, two doses of these vaccines have anywhere between um, 60 to 93% effectiveness. Again, single dose is not sufficient um, um, in, in terms of protection. Again, just a little bit more about the real world experience in terms of vaccine effectiveness. Um, this is, these are data from Qatar um, that um, uh, where there was sort of massive um, mass vaccination campaign with the Pfizer BioNTech um, vaccine that started in December. Um, and it really sort of co-occurred um, in the midst of a second and third wave of SARS-CoV-2 infections that were triggered by expansion of these alpha um, and beta uh, variants that exploded in, in Qatar. And these are data that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so peer reviewed, that really showed that two doses of the vaccine were effective in protecting kind of from severe critical um, disease caused by these variants. So really um, kind of underlining the importance of, of, vaccinate, of effective vaccination campaigns. And this really sort of highlights the fact that um, you know, as we as we kind of think about kind of the urgency of vaccinating um, as many individuals as possible, in order to um, prevent um, variants from from emerging, because as we know, as the more the virus sort of is circulating, the more opportunities it has to mutate. 
uh, to replicate and to mutate, and then sort of potentially to produce new variants of concern, uh, which can be more transmissible, um, can cause more severe disease, and can you know sort of have greater capacity to evade from under the vaccine pressure. Um, I think the global capacity to monitor and sequence these viruses are critical in order to kind of to track and flag any significant changes that are happening epidemiologically. Um, and of course, you know, so public health interventions that um, have been limiting the spread of these variants are critical, but as critical is also the rapid and equitable distribution of vaccines um, kind of around the, around the rural lobes. It really can reach areas um, that are sort of now poorly covered um, and can kind of achieve that um, um, uh, kind of a sort of threshold immunization um, that is needed to control the pandemic. Remaining questions that I think we'll need to talk about is kind of, do we need to, will we need to revaccinate um, and will we need uh, booster vaccines? But I think that's a, that's a question that I'm sure um, we can have a discussion um, on um, following the presentation. So those are just some, some um, slides and data I wanted to um, share uh, with all of you to kind of stimulate a discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sobieschik. Um, uh, for, for those of us who came in uh, a minute or two too late, I just wanted to let the uh, audience know that we're eager to have a lively discussion and Q&A at the end of our speaker's prepared remarks. Uh, after our next two speakers take about 10 minutes each for their prepared remarks, we will uh, move over to that discussion. Our next speaker is Professor Bhavan Sampat. Uh, he's an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management in Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. He studies the economics and political economy of the life sciences industries with a particular focus on innovation, pricing, and access to pharmaceuticals. Thank you, Bhavan. Great, thanks. Thanks, Ashley, and thanks to the Richmond Center for, for inviting me to, to be part of this esteemed panel. I'm going to discuss the public and private sector roles in um, COVID vaccine innovation, which I'll argue represent a model of innovation that um, was actually very different and continues to be very different from the status quo ante in ways that are of continued relevance to policy debates today, including a number of the important issues just raised by, by Magda, um, how we get enough vaccine to protect the world, to guard against variants, to provide necessary boosters and, and, and whatnot. But um, before we get to that, um, we go back in time to, to 2019, January 2019, um, um, or thereabouts, um, sort of the pre-pandemic uh, era. Um, and, I'm going to do a little bit of a caricature here. Hopefully it's not a gross one, but for, for purposes of time, what did the biomedical innovation system look like? Essentially, there were two, and I'm, I'm speaking most, mostly of the US here. Essentially, there's two major types of policy levers there. One is push funding or government funding of research in the US, typically by the National Institutes of Health to the tune of about $40 billion a year mostly supporting so-called basic research at, at universities like, like this one. Importantly, very little explicit emphasis on development or diffusion or, or what we would call downstream activities. On the other side, we have so-called pull incentives. These are just terms that economists and others have used, um, which in the, in, in the context of pharmaceuticals typically uh, were in the form of patent protected profits. Um, so the patent system, um, uh, as the theory goes, uh, incentivize, incentivize firms to, to do R&D, um, including in pharmaceuticals, uh, costly trials, development, and, and whatnot. Um, and patents are meant to promote innovation through the lure of super competitive prices. And there's kind of a long empirical legacy, maybe 70 years at this point in economics, that actually in most fields, patents don't matter all that much. But in, in pharmaceuticals, they actually um, are an important uh, innovation incentive. But the downside of patents is that they, even if they promote innovation, they do so through high prices and restricted access and kind of finding that sweet spot is, is the core of, of patent policy. So that's a bit of sort of throat clearing. Um, the COVID-19 innovation system, um, as, as I understand it, um, um, and it's actually quite murky actually, and uh, to try to actually put together, you know, this will be historians of the future who kind of actually put together what went on. Um, my other projects on World War II, which is an easier model of crisis innovation to study at this point. But um, as far as we understand it, 
the COVID system was very different from, from what I just described in several, in several different ways. First, um, from the beginning in the US and globally, there was a heavy focus on vaccines as the best hope for a return to, to so-called normalcy. Um, and this is reflected in the funding data, uh, murky as it is in the US and globally, um, uh, and, and among philanthropies, the vast majority of public funding goes to vaccines. There were, by the way, some, some um, critics early on. So some of you may remember that uh, uh, a New York Times um, infographic April of last year saying, hey, it takes a long time to develop a vaccine. And maybe, you know, they didn't quite say this, but maybe we don't want to get our hopes too high. And maybe we don't want to put all our eggs in this basket, right? Um, and that, it's quite interesting to think about in retrospect. Um, so there were some criticisms of that. And in particular, maybe we should be, be putting more money into therapeutics that were important um, in previous crises responses, including for HIV. But so this is an interesting and sharp shift. Up until that point, vaccine innovation and the vaccine market was seen to a prone of as being, being prone to what we economists would call a bunch of market failures, both on the supply and demand side. And this had actually led to thinking um, by Michael Kramer, Jeff Sachs, Joe Stiglitz, and various NGOs of other mechanisms to stimulate vaccine innovation, including prizes and advanced market commitments and things like that, beyond the push and pull mechanisms I just talked about. So keep, keep, keep that in mind. A second way in which the focus was different is essentially crisis R&D is all about time. Right, crisis R&D is about time to resolution. Uh, economists have for a long time pointed out the high value of health research, but it becomes quite vivid when we're losing $10 billion a day globally in GDP, right? That, that essentially, it, but not only do we need uh, innovation, but we need it quickly. So if, if there was one calculation that if we doubled what we were spending on, on Operation Warp Speed, which you've all heard of, and, uh, and that only, led to the arrival of a vaccine like a day earlier, it would still pay for itself or something like that, right? So you get into these kind of paradoxical cal calculations here, but we spent a lot of money, but like we spent a lot of money uh, with an explicit focus on speed. Um, so we fund multiple rival risk platforms, um, sort of take a portfolio approach with the focus on those that can be scaled quickly, though importantly, um, and, and I'm talking of the US now, they can be scaled quickly in the US, right? Um, um, and, uh, you know, we spent quite a bit of money, though, actually quite uh, much less than, than economists and others suggested we should at the time. But it's still a, a substantial increase in publicly funded biomedical R&D, again, mostly on the vaccine side. The third thing to say about the push instrument, and then I'll turn, then I'll turn to, to poll very quickly, is that it was very different qualitatively from what public sector funding looked like previously. It was not focused much or actually at all on basic research, but rather the public sector, um, interestingly, not through the NIH, but, but through uh, BARDA essentially and Warp Speed um, was involved in funding late stage trials, development, manufacturing and manufacturing at risk, picking specific firms, um, either picking winners or, or supporting front runners. So suffice it to say, this is not your father's Oldsmobile as the old commercial went, um, um, a much more applied end-to-end -end approach than traditional public sector activities, again, reflecting time. So in, in those three ways, the push side was different. Let me turn quickly now to the, to the pull side, um, the reward side. Even before the pandemic, there was growing criticism and concern of the dominant pull mechanism patents, um, and, and in particular that they could restrict access to medicines and lead to high prices. Um, we heard this. In, in the kind of counter harmonization to the so-called TRIPS agreement that globalized pharmaceutical patent protection in the mid 1990s. Um, and then also more recently uh, concerns about patents and, and high prices and restricted access in the drug price debates of 2018 and 19, which were seeping into the, the presidential election then. So then along comes COVID and there are a number of kind of tools to push back on patents um, from TRIPS exemptions to patent challenges to compulsory licenses at various points. They were sort of in the ether and people began thinking about um, how to, uh, how, whether and how to leverage them to uh, promote access to COVID-19 therapies and vaccines. And on the other side, you saw the sort of same arguments um, marshaled against, against these measures saying innovation is the key to beating in COVID and actually strong patents are needed now more than ever. Um, and, and I suspect we'll get back to that um, at some point. My own sense uh, is just 
that the role of patents for both innovation and diffusion was, and in some sense is quite different in the COVID context than in normal times or even in previous crises. Um, and three reasons why. First, timing. Um, when I was writing a year ago in, in the midst of the rush of new R&D activity on COVID, I noted that you know, patents aren't even published until 18 months after filing and then take you know, several years to grant. So the work that was being done, say in March, April, May of last year, we're not gonna see patents on that for, for, quite, some, for quite some time. Um, um, we're just starting to see some of the applications get published. Uh, and uh, in a way it's pat, pat previous patents on platform technologies and whatnot, uh, include, including some that are held by the NIH, may be more important for innovation than the prospect of future patents, which is a sort of reversal of how things actually work or usually work. Second, relevance. Um, I said earlier that patents are, are particularly important. Uh, actually, I didn't say this. Um, uh, I should have said patents are particularly important for drugs, but all that's based on small molecule pharmaceuticals. Um, for COVID therapies, so complicated drugs, so biologics, vaccines, imitation, even absent patents um, can be hard. Um, unlike HIV AIDS uh, drugs, for example, which are small molecule drugs and relatively easy to reverse engineer, just getting rid of patents may not be enough for scale up. And that, that matters very much in some of the policy debates for today. And then finally, the, another way in which the system um, was different was that there was another big pull uh, incentive in the form of so-called advanced market commitments. In addition to the push funding for the ad individual firms, we also had large advanced market commitments essentially um, um, for, for the Pfizer's and Moderna's and, and the other firms involved in, in warp speed and similar efforts. What's interesting though, and what makes them different from say the theoretical prizes, um, like say for a malaria vaccine or something that were previously being discussed is first, they were with specific firms rather than market wide. Um, and second, they were in a sense as much a tool of vaccine nationalism to kind of get to the front of the queue as they were um, as, um, as innovation incentives. So on the poll side, things too um, are different for, for those reasons. So anyhow, why don't I, that was sort of a tour of recent, of recent history, but I think uh, a number of these topics remain crucial today um, um, for thinking about how we move forward now um, for the problem of, of global scale up um, in, in, an equitable, in an equitable way and for thinking about innovation policy going forward. So why don't I stop there and, um, and turn the floor back over to Ashley. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Sampat. Um, uh, our, our last uh, speaker and uh, last panelist is uh, Dr. Wafal Sadr. Uh, she is the University Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine, the Director of ICAP, uh, the Director of Columbia World Projects, and the Mathilde Krim Amfar Professor of Global Health at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. Her work through ICAP aims to address ma major public health challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic in more than 30 countries worldwide using research, education, training, and program design, implementation, scale up, and evaluation. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. El Sadr, I'll turn it over to you. Thank well, you thank for joining you very, us. And thank you very much, um, Ashley, and, and thank you, um, Steve, and also thank you to my colleagues on the panel and uh, for all your important insights. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, what I could add to this conversation, but maybe uh, let me put it this way. If there's one word that I want you to keep in mind at the end of my, my brief comments is, the, is urgency. I think we need to keep that in mind is that there's enormous urgency to solve the problem now. And this is something that I hope uh, will, will motivate the conversation afterwards and the discussion. Uh, I think for those of you who have been fortunate enough to get vaccinated, and I'm one of them, uh, you can uh, probably relive that moment of uh, feeling the great relief after getting vaccinated and the sense of um, incredible comfort and joy and uh, achievement. And, um, and uh, I, I, I really hope that we can bring this to many people around the world. I was recently in Africa. I was on work travel to Mozambique and Iswatini and also in conversations with our teams elsewhere around the, in the continent. And it is uh, really pretty uh, heartbreaking uh, to note the, the lack of access to vaccination uh, at this point in time, leaving huge swaths of populations that are vulnerable to this, this virus and also vulnerable to these repeated surges uh, of, uh, of COVID-19. 
So, um, and, and, it, and I think Magda, both Magda and Bob, and touched on the issue of uh, disparities, and and uh, and that's uh, probably what uh, really got me involved in in global health is way back in the early uh, in the late 1990s, in the early 2000s, which was the huge disparity. Uh, that where people living with HIV in wealthy countries like the United States had access to life-saving uh, medications, uh, while the millions of people in, in most of the rest of the world, particularly in Africa, were dying with absolutely no hope and with absolutely no chance of access uh, to medications. And it took really shaking uh, the system and uh, by activists who uh, could not be told to wait. I mean, activists don't wait. Activists want action today. They want urgent action and it took a lot of uh, motivation by activists and by others and their and their supporters uh, to be able to bring treatment uh, uh, to uh, HIV treatment to millions and millions and it'd be interesting Bavin actually I know you know this history very well uh, for you to maybe bring some uh, contrast between what happened then and what needs to happen now when we're talking about vaccines because I think there are uh, a lot of uh, similarities uh, between uh, the two situations, the disparity, obviously, as well as the enormous need and also the urgency. Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is that the um, is 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 that uh, you know what should what should motivate the world to vaccinate the world? I mean, that's kind of an important question. Uh, what should motivate each and every one of us to vaccinate the world? And I think, obviously as an infectious disease specialist like Magda is, um, we know that infection spread from one person to the, to the next and therefore uh, uh, COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere. Um, so that there is self-interest in terms of uh, prevention of spread of infections, particularly prevention of uh, the development of new variants that Magda mentioned that could uh, potentially outsmart our vaccines. Uh, so there is the, the self-interest uh, motivation uh, which should be pretty high, I would say, um, uh, unless people imagined, and it's unrealistic, that somehow we'll build walls around this country and nobody can travel, and therefore we are never going to be um, uh, challenged by a new, a new variant, for example, amongst uh, in, this, in our population. And then the other is, of course, the um, you know the other uh, argument for uh, for and for the urgency to provide vaccination uh, access is of course equity issues around equity equity issues around the ethics and so on um, and uh, and 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 I think it's really important to discuss how we weigh you know the the and and all of these interests versus some of these other uh, reasons that people are raising about the need to, uh, or the, the lack of uh, urgency in terms of trying to get vaccines to the world. So important to think about essentially what are the, what are the uh, political, what's the political environment now that exists within this country and other wealthy countries in terms of uh, the, what, motiv what are the motivators as well as also what are the, uh, what are the, uh, the, the things that really uh, make them hesitant um, uh, to engage in this in this um, in this effort, and uh, and I think the the um, another point that I wanted to 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 touch on is um, is is the um, you know is the issue of thinking about vaccine vac not just vaccines but vaccination. And that's really important. Um, I think that having vaccines available is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, we learned that from the HIV uh, global response. Yes, you can bring pills and they can arrive at the airport in country X, but that's that's necessary, but that's not sufficient to get those pills into to people who are living with HIV. They may not even know that they have HIV. Uh, they may not know uh, where to get the treatment, that people don't, are not trained to provide the treatment and there's no supply chain and uh, so on and so forth. So I think we need to think of vaccination as global vaccination, uh, as access, as the goal, rather than thinking of the vaccine and how many doses of vaccine and so on. And, and that's really critical. And what made the difference in terms 
terms of the global HIV response was the broad thinking in terms of, it's not just shipping pills into, uh, into countries, but rather investments in terms of the systems, the health systems that are needed to be able to bring those vaccines or bring those pills to the people who need them. And that's very complicated. It's not simple. Uh, I was recently in, a, in one of the countries I was mentioning, sitting with the Minister of Health, who said, you know, uh, we're getting a shipment tomorrow, a donation from China uh, tomorrow uh, of vaccines. It's going to arrive at the airport at, I think she said like 12.02 or something. I mean, people really knew exactly the precise moment that the airplane was going to land. Uh, but, uh, and they had a plan on, it, on paper, you know, that looked really good. But we know there's a big difference between a plan on, on paper sitting on a shelf and how do you operationalize this? And that requires uh, investments and that requires investments in health system that requires uh, providing all that's needed to keep these vaccines viable, of course, uh, that they uh, in uh, that they remain um, in good shape, the cold chain and the training and the getting the population to be aware about vaccines, getting to be, them to be confident about the vaccines, getting them to be willing to get vaccinated, as well as, of course, where are they going to get vaccinated by whom and so on. So I urge that as we're thinking about um, uh, this whole topic is, uh, uh, is, is to think about the whole cascade of events that really need to occur in order for us to get to a vaccinated uh, gl global population. And we've learned the hard way in this country, actually, in the very bumpy early uh, months of or early weeks and early months of vaccination in a wealthy country like ours, is that we did not think through all the different steps uh, carefully ahead of time. And you can imagine, of course, in less resource countries that this cascade is so important uh, to get to that last mile, to get that uh, finally the vaccines in people's arms. So just in summary, I would say to keep in mind two things. I think this situation is urgent and, um, uh, and, uh, and why is it urgent? I talked about that. And also the importance of thinking of the vaccination overall rather than solely of, uh, of vaccines. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. al Um, uh, Thank you to all of our speakers for sharing your insights on the landscape and on the burning issues we need to think through in order to get from where we are now to global herd immunity or, or whatever uh, a more uh, feasible end point is. Uh, you've all made the case that we need more resources, we need them everywhere, we need them deployed effectively, and we need them yesterday. Uh, I'll take advantage of my spot as moderator and kick off the discussion myself now. And uh, I'll also urge our audience members to enter questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, one question to kick us off. Uh, Magda, you spoke about how vaccines and monoclonal antibodies respond to the different COVID-19 uh, variants that have arisen. Obviously, every time a new variant pops up, there's a fear about how the vaccines will perform against it. Should we be more actively, and this is something I, I have no idea about, should we be more actively targeting vaccines to places where the variants are spreading? Does, is that something we should be doing? No, that's a, you know, that's an excellent question. And I think, you know, in, in, um, in an area of um, limitless resources, <laughs> where we in, in a time of in any kind of a spot of limitless resources, I think you know we would be deploying vaccines everywhere equitably um, at, a, at the same rate um, and kind of and also sort of bolstering the public health infrastructure that that Wafa was talking about. But I think you know if one other approach would be to sort of to be if one can be sort of more kind of strategic and and proactive um, in terms of sort of deploying it to to areas where they're needed the most for example um, you know I, I showed that those sort of the maps from from New York Times about the global hotspots right where um, where the, the cases are surging and those are just because the virus is, is replicating and it's mutating those are also the areas where the the variants are are, are quite prevalent and are spreading. So one, you know, um, kind of in a perfect world, a strategic approach would be sort of to deploy vaccines there quickly um, and, and, and vaccinate as many people as possible. But I think I would actually sort of caution against sort of limiting ourselves only to such an approach, because I think, you know, an important kind of fundamental um, and sort of the fundamentals of, of delivering a vaccine to everybody is just to make sure that everybody is 
covered regardless of whether or not they live in an area whether there are a lot of variants just because if we don't vaccinate um, people adequately um, they they can um, transmit the, the the virus amongst sort of kind of in the community and that itself can lead uh, you know, sort of lead to emergence of variants so we would forever be chasing our tail in a way if we're only kind of deploying vaccines to areas of kind of you know where you have um um, where you have lots of variants. I think in, in, in an ideal world, you'll be able to kind of to, you know, sort of to really kind of vaccinate everybody at the same rapid pace, regardless of, of, of whether or not there are sort of, you know, kind of um, um, surges of, of variants or not. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so coming back to the, the local landscape a little bit in, in the U.S. and what we've learned in recent months. Uh, Ashley, a, Ashley. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Can I follow up on that? I actually, please, please is, do. And is it okay? Yeah, um, yeah because absolutely. I actually want to hear um, both of my fellow panelists um, thoughts on this. So my understanding is that that, you know, so the US and, and the EU, I mean, the US just yesterday, or the day before, right, like, they're going to be Biden committed a whole bunch of doses. But a lot of that's going through COVAX. Um, right. And COVAX explicitly has a population based scheme where they want to basically like 20 percent of the population, which seems like the opposite of targeting um, or, or something like that. Precise. <laughs> what is it? 20, 21? 21 OK. Yeah. yeah, well, that's important. And then like there's other countries that are kind of like China mm -hmm. and Russia I get, I mean, that are maybe even the U.S. like using this as a tool of foreign policy jockeying. Um, and so. Uh, maybe 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 because the Covax one is easier. Um, like, is there any is there any sense in which Covax is rethinking that to do the kind of more like, targeted uh, routing that, that that Ashley uh, and Magda spoke of, um, or is that just kind of fixed at this point? Well, I, I can comment, and I think obviously Magda, you can as well. I think the I mean, what well, personally, I think you know, what do you need to get the impact we want? You need good vaccines. You need vaccines that are, are efficacious, right? And that's number one requirement. Number two is you need high coverage um, in order to make, um, to have the impact you desire, right? So so number one for COVAX is, of course, they need to be focusing on the probably, hopefully the highest, the vaccines with the highest efficacy. And as we know thus far, it has been the, the mRNA vaccines, which have limitations, but they do have substantially uh, they've been shown again and again, not only in the original studies to be the most efficacious, but also to, to have a, a pretty good coverage of most of these variants that have uh, been, uh, that have arisen. So, so I feel like COVAX should really focus on how can they get the best vaccines possible, right? That's important. And they're now broadening, they're going to be uh, procuring any vaccine that's uh, authorized by WHO, which includes several AstraZeneca, as well as also two Chinese vaccines. So I, and then the coverage is another one. And I personally think that it would be extremely helpful for COVAX. And I don't know if this has been done or not to do, to work with some modelers, you know, and to, to really think about the, the populations in these countries and think about in the countries vary substantially also from low to middle income countries in terms of the age distribution of the population, um, in terms of the urban versus uh, rural and so on, and to try to do some modeling to see how they can best use the vaccines that they get access to based on the efficacy of the vaccines and also the desired uh, coverage in order to achieve uh, protection of the population. I don't know if that's been done, maybe above and you might know, uh, but I do, I think there are, it would be really interesting to, to do this kind of modeling and come up with probably an optimal or a target coverage that based on which vaccine, but a target coverage for specific countries and, and go, go that route. I think that'd be probably the more scientific way rather than to say, we're gonna go to 20% uh, for everybody. And, and I agree that that would be sort of, you know, kind of the optimal approach. And I think, you know, if we think about this, things have been happening so quickly in terms of how kind of also sort of the knowledge gained about, you know, which variants are emerging, whereas I think, kind of this this level of modeling has to march hand in hand with kind of that genomic surveillance right and kind of feeding the data so we kind of we know yeah. where where the not only where the hot spots are in terms of case counts but kind of where are these more transmissible and you know more concerning variants occurring so you could kind of deploy and target vaccines to this area so i feel like 
it, we're definitely not, I think we're getting there, but, and, but I worry that it, it, it's, it takes time to get there. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe in the next pandemic and stuff, we, we, we hopefully we'll have it together, you know? I mean, um, I think another challenge is that this is a two dose, most are two dose vaccines. Um, and right. that adds complexity as well. Like uh, in some countries, where I've been, you know, they get a, a supply and they go out and vaccinate everybody. So everybody gets one dose and that's it. And then there's nothing coming. There's no airplane coming with vaccines. So I think that kind of planning is critical. Um, and I think that's where modelers and others can, can really assist countries in terms of really uh, COVAX in knowing what to do and also countries in knowing what to do with the supply that they receive. Um, so, Following up on that question, or on, on the points that you folks just raised, Bobin mentioned uh, the Biden administration's announcement to purchase 500 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, which is one of the mRNA vaccines. Uh, another kind of staggering statistic I've seen recently is that uh, China has been vaccinating 20 million people a day in China and has supplied uh, a huge supply. I, I think I saw a statistic around 350 million doses of the two, uh, two of the Chinese vaccines um, that to my understanding have lower efficacy than the mRNA vaccines that have emergency use, use authorization in the US. Um, in terms of targeting, uh, do we know if there's any coordination uh, between COVAX, uh, the Biden administration uh, and China regarding how to target these different kind of vaccine platforms to different places? I'm okay, so the short answer is no. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, um, you know, uh, um, I, I don't know right now, I don't know about the Biden administration, but I mean, this, the really striking thing about this is uh, about, about the efforts that I described, you know, in 2020 is there was actually quite a bit more coordination on the vaccine side than you typically see in normal times, but very little global coordination, yeah. right? Like, so within the US there was, but, and, and then again, going back to World War II, which occupies the other half of my mind, like there where there was cooperation amongst the allies and then, then mm -hmm. you get into interesting terms, like knowledge sharing and you, know, you guys work on this and we'll work on this, but there was none of that. I mean, and that was obviously in some ways reflective of the previous administration's um, priorities, um, right? He who should not be named, uh, but but uh, um, yeah, I don't know that there's been much done since, but honestly, I haven't been, I haven't been paying attention yet. So, um, so we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, Jeffrey Gordon asks, to what extent is vaccine supply limited by IP protection, not just patents, but trade secrets? I think that's a Bavin question. <laughs> Well, it's, it's something I've thought about. Um, it's something I've thought about. Um, no, I, I think, I think I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it trade secrets as a form of intellectual property. I, I think just more generally know how is, is, is how I would think mm -hmm. about it, which is that there's, co that putting aside, putting aside um, the IP per se, the question is if you got rid of the patents um, or if you made you know small changes to WTO rules to, to kind of provide a little more room for maneuver, whether you could get the imitation um, as you did at some point by sophisticated generics in, in the HIV case, or whether you need active know-how transfer, and then what the latter looks like. Is it turn over your blueprints and turn over your cell lines or something like that? Um, um, or is it, hey, Pfizer and Moderna, send your best engineers over to us and help us figure out how to do this. Um, and so I've heard, I've heard anecdotes that, that if you just open up the patent space that uh, um, there are sophisticated firms poised to figure this out. Um, but I've heard on the other side, including uh, among some of the activists um, who, who are proposing uh, relaxation of, of patents uh, that we really, the next step is somehow compelling know-how transfer, which if it involves actually people transfer, I don't, I, I just think that's a tricky problem. And, and I don't know how you can actually force firms to do it. Um, I mean, the issue is, I mean, we have a, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I might be naive, but I'm an optimist as well, is I mean, this is like a global crisis that we've never had before, right? I mean, 
it's um, and the question is we maybe we should think about what should be done and then make it happen. I mean, I feel like again, I mean, we've and many of us have done this where you know you 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 want to teach some. We work with people in country X, and in order for them to to learn a technique to do in the lab, they go to lab X and uh, to lab Y, and they learn how to do it, and they go back and they're able to do it. And so I I do think that. Um, the decision needs to be made is that we need to do whatever. We need to do technology transfer if we are to deal with the urgency. We can continue to send doses and so on. Is that sufficient? I don't know. But there needs to be an expansion capacity, production capacity, as I understand it, above and right? And in order to expand capacity for production, you need to think of everywhere. And there's some countries that have, there kind of been pharmaceutical leaders like India, Brazil, South Africa, Egypt is another one. And and uh, and those are the to think outside the box and think about how can we utilize the global capacity and invest in uh, knowledge transfer so that actually we can increase the um, the 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 output of these vaccines. Uh, and I feel like and I realize there's some uh, you know raw material issue shortages and so on, but it it really requires a much more of a of a determination to, similar to what happened in this country in, turn, in order to get us to the vaccines we have now, there needs to be kind of a similar concerted effort to say, okay, we wanna to get to this and this is the way we're gonna to get to it. And we're gonna try both the donation route, like it's what's being done by the US now or by China, for example, or Russia, but we're also going to, at the same time, we realize we have to improve uh, production and we're gonna use, see what we can do to expand production in this country, but also around the world as well. Yeah, um, I agree, and I, and I, I mean, you know, I have that. I, I, I agree, and in some sense, we shouldn't be trapped by by, by our old mindsets about. It. I just don't know. I mean, I agree that we should do it, but to the extent it requires Moderna sending over engineers, I don't. I just don't know how you like, or you know, uh, chemists. I just don't know how you actually make them do that. Um, you know, uh, or and how you enforce how you enforce that even if you know maybe they send like you know their B team over or something like that. And so um, I, I I think it's I think it's a, and, and then there's a separate question actually. I've been thinking about it this way too, which is uh, like maybe this is like an empirical question. I like to uh, and just are markets for technology working well here? So mm -hmm. is there slack capacity out? Is there is there latent capacity out there? that the Pfizer's and Moderna's of the world aren't finding? Mm. Um, and if so, why? Like, why, why aren't they finding it? Or are there bargaining breakdowns? Do they not want to give, our, give away mRNA because that's going to be like their profits of the future? And so I just want to really understand, you know, what's not working here now? And then what, both from, le from a legal tool perspective, mm -hmm. but also from a practical perspective, you could actually do to, to get them to share the know-how if in fact that's what's what's needed, but I, it, it's something I'm still struggling with, um, um, to be honest. And I, I say this as someone who has not been a big fan of trips, you know, historically. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. yeah. um, Wafa, you have called for increased investment in manufacturing capacity to boost production of the mRNA vaccines and for aid to support distribution in other countries. Have the vaccine manufacturers been receptive to public private partnership kind of proposals like this? Uh, not that we've seen it. I mean, I think the the hope was that because um, the at least the Moderna vaccine, which is really built on a platform that was uh, really the NIH are the one is the one that um, you know uh, started this whole trajectory for, and then handed over to Moderna to uh, to commercialize this uh, these vaccines. Is that uh, our uh, you know my hope is that the the U.S. government can use its um, clout to be able to, at least with Moderna, to be able to do something along the lines that I was just saying before. Um, I mean, could there be new incentives? I think Bavin brings up an important point is what are the kinds of incentives that could be given to these companies? Obviously, money always <laughs> works. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, wealthy countries have a lot of money, a lot of resources. And if somebody decides that this is important, I'm sure these companies would be uh, motivated to do what's needed. I think it, it, everything has a price, to be honest with you. And I think particularly for the NIH Moderna access, I feel there's more hope in that access because of that, uh, to push on that front. And uh, 
So I think that's the hope is that this can, can work that way. Yeah. I don't know, uh, Bavin, what you think. Um, I, I agree that's the best bet. I, I still think you'll run into the know-how problem in it. And I don't know, I mean, I see Chris Morton is here in the, in the, in the participant list and he's thought about this um, mm -hmm. uh, more than anyone perhaps, or, or certainly more than I have, I should say. Uh, I don't know how you enforce, I, I, I don't know how you actually enforce the NIH patent uh, um, to actually get Moderna to do what they want to do. I mean, as I understand it, it requires an injunction, which may not, I don't, know. I, I don't know. So I think it's still tricky, but I agree that's the, that's the best hope. I do think that in general, uh, public sector investment in manufacturing capacity, uh, not just for now, but also for, for the future, um, would have huge payoffs. So I, you know, I described this model where the public sector traditionally did this basic research and left the, left the applied up to the private uh, in, my, in my opening gambit. But I mean, I think that needs to change at least in the area of vaccines where we need public sector capabilities to be, ab to be able to, um, to do this stuff essentially, because I think we're seeing some of the problems here of relying only on the pi private sector. So maybe we need like a public option to use that language mm -hmm. um, that we can leverage um, in the short run, hopefully, but, but certainly in the medium to long run. I mean, I, I have to say that over my years of working in many parts of the world and, and um, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of talent out there. And when people say, um, it's not gonna be possible and it's gonna be hard. And it's it just, that's not what I see. I mean, I see on the ground, enormous innovation, enormous talent. Uh, I've seen how you can transform a laboratory and uh, lab workers who have been, you know, sort of working in neglected environments have never really received the inputs. And all of a sudden, almost overnight, they are doing sophisticated assays and they're able to do amazing work. So I'm, I'm, I'm a strong believer that um, it's, um, uh, I, I'm always a little bit um, taken aback when there's the perception that somehow it's going to, it's very tough and it's going to be yeah. very tough for people to learn how to do this. I, that's not sure. been my experience. Well, I, I, I mean, first of all, I hope you're right. <laughs> um, you know, and I hope I'm wrong about this. Um, um, absolutely. And, uh, uh, and, and, and honestly, like, I think they can do it. Like, you know, there's nothing stopping them right now from doing it. Um, so I don't know that, you know, in, in some sense, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think they should try. I think they should try. Um, I don't. I don't think, uh, um, with or without the trips waiver, I don't think they get this tremendous legal risk in doing so right now. But yeah, so I, I agree. I, and 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 again, I think I'm skeptical, but I'm like 60 40 skeptical, and I'd be very happy to be wrong about this. So yeah. Um, Mike, did, did you have any perspective on the the potential uh, for public private partnerships to save the day? I, I, I mean, I agree that the, um, that's the direction that we need to be moving. And I think it's the direction that we've, that's the balance that we've tried to strike in many other sort of fields, at least in kind of in, in infectious diseases and drug development and vaccine development. And it's incredibly, it's, it's critical and, and very, uh, you know, it's important. Um, I, I do think that I think the reason that there needs to be that balance is because there has to, it's not like, you know, with push and pull, there has to be an incentive for the companies to develop drugs, right? Um, they may not want to invest into kind of this intensely expensive pipeline of, of this iterative process and, and failures <laughs> and, and many failures which are expensive and that can only come from kind of through innovation, you know, in academic settings and kind of in the, in the public sector and, and also by building up the infrastructure and capacity in the areas that you're talking about Wafa, right? Where um, kind of there is a lot of, um, there, was, there was sort of great kind of intellectual cap capital that just needs to be supported and sustained. And a lot of innovation can come uh, from other parts of the world. So I think it's, it's really critical not only to get us out of this, but also to, I think, as we're kind of thinking about future um, epidemics, pandemics, whatever they may be, right? Just so that we're prepared for this. Um, how to enforce it? <laughs> I think that's, um, that's a million dollar question and how to kind of incentivize it also, not just enforce it, but incentivize it. So that kind of, um, that sort of both worlds um, uh, 
kind of, you know, um, are incentivized to do this. Um, we, have a, we have a response from Chris Morton in the audience uh, with some exclamation points. So he's passionate about it. Uh, he says, no injunction required to compel Moderna to transfer know-how. Just uh, assert the US government's patent with a demand for damages rather than an injunction, um, plus threaten to exercise the Defense Production Act. Uh, and he put a, a helpful uh, citation to Kapsinski and uh, Reventhron uh, in the uh, Q&A if anybody's interested in following up on that. But he also says uh, he agrees with Dr. Al Sauter that Biden should act, uh, the stakes are too high to wait any longer. I, I just often, often also, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, Chris. Um, I, I get the sense that everybody's afraid of, a, the companies are afraid of a precedent, uh, that somehow if they let go of this, this is the end for innovation for any drug development in the future. I, I just, you know, they make it feel like this or they make, or they make people feel that this is gonna be the end of innovation in the pharma uh, sector forever. I mean, we're just asking for this one acute emergency now, um, and um, and can that can that be segmented in a way so that there isn't the sense that it's a slippery slope, and therefore if we if we let go on this, then it means we won't have the we won't be able to innovate in the future. I mean, this is a very very. Can we just think of it as a very focused intervention? That's my question. Can I just uh, just uh, a, a few responses? First to Chris, yeah, I mean, it's, it's too bad. Um, I'm not gonna reply in the comments, but uh, yeah, no, no, I've, 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 I've read, uh, I mean, he sent an article by Amy, a former co-author of mine, uh, and, uh, and I get it, I get it. But at the end of the day, um, I, I don't know, to the extent that the know-how is, as Robert Oppenheimer has pointed out, you know, about, like wrapped up in people, right? Like, I don't know how you can get them to actually, you know, Moderna, like to, to actually um, send, send their folks over and share it. And I don't know how you can enforce that. Um, um, and, you know, Chris, um, but yes, I, I take the point. I take the point and, and uh, uh, I'm glad uh, Chris clarified the legal, the legal point as well. Um, on Waffle's point, I think it's complete, like, especially in the context where the federal government spent you know, money on the platform technology, but also we don't know what the private sector spent to be fair, but also, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's poured a lot of money into the, they, like they funded the trials, they funded the development, right? Like, you know, I think the idea that, you know, uh, a, a TRIPS waiver, which by the way, uh, you know, it's pretty narrow as written. I mean, it gives a little bit more wiggle room to, 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 to countries. Um, like the idea that that's gonna have a major impact on innovation or on, uh, 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 firms' incentives to participate in these crisis innovation efforts. I also don't think that that's true, actually. I don't, I don't buy that either. And I think uh, what's interesting on the political economy side of it is actually this. Um, uh, so Wafa, you propose, say, let's just use it for, for this purpose. But what, you know, what I worry about a little bit is compulsory licensing is, as you know, already built into TRIPS, right? Yes. Countries already have the ability to do stuff that, that you and others fought very hard for. Um, and actually this move that, you know, we need that, we now need this extra space for this specific problem might then undermine, you know, countries' abilities to use it for cancer and all this other stuff. So it's an interesting just strategy um, issue, issue, issue as well that one could think about, yeah, so. Uh, so I'm gonna raise a question that I've, I've been very curious about. We're, we're talking about, a, a lot of the things we're talking about now are, um, uh, increasing um, the, the push investments that Bob and you were talking about, you know, increased uh, investment in uh, manufacturing and, and also changing, changing some of the rules. Um, do any of you have a perspective on, on whether it's, it's better to take some of those strategies versus just taking a huge pile of money, like as high as the, you know, the new buildings going up on the north side of the park? Um, and uh, or the south side of the park, and uh, and holding a procurement auction and saying, you know, we we're ready, we're ready to pay for this. There's 200 vaccine candidates out there. Um, we need to vaccinate the world. Here's money if you do it. Do do we have a perspective on that? Is that kind of not enough? Hmm. 
perhaps that's just not going to happen. And so it's not really. Well, I don't see why. Not. I don't see why not. Why I, not? I, I don't. Yeah. You mean you mean like a large advanced market, a, a large advanced market commitment? You know, give us you know a billion doses at a hundred dollars a dose, or you know yeah. some really big number, and then you guys figure out like you know if 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 the mm -hmm. manufacturers Wafa, if the latent manufacturers that Wafa speaks of are out there, then have Pfizer go find them, you know, or find the number that makes it makes it worthwhile for them to go find them. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's uh, mm -hmm. that's another that's another approach. It has to it gets back to the question of whether markets for technology are working well. Um, for me, there's actually so much uncertainty about any of these that we actually have to kind of hedge a little bit and, and try a few different things. Um, so the two are not mutually exclusive, I don't think, right? Like uh, the public option and also another large AMC. Um, and it's all, ex you know, it's just money, but as, as Alex Tabarak from, you know, George Mason is, is it, he's basically said we're spending billions to save trillions. So even from an economic perspective, um, uh, you know, and certainly from an, from an ethical um, uh, one, um, these things could pay off. So I think we have to pursue different strategies simultaneously. Yeah. And I guess one one question that I also sort of I wanted to raise in this because it's in this sort of model you're kind of seeing who's going to make it to the finish line first, right? Or who's going to kind of deliver? So there has to be also, and I don't want to use the regulatory oversight, but sort of almost like quality oversight, right? Over time as to so which product is you know so which manufacturer which product is going to make it to the finish line, but who's going to be monitoring the fact that this is going to be. The, the production will be of sufficient enough quality and then enough sort of doses that it actually will meet that bar that has been set or should be set kind of in a sustained fashion. So that's sort of another important investment, I think, that has to kind of march hand in hand uh, with kind of, you know, ramping up production um, and, um, uh, and, and kind of making sure that it's sustainable and of high enough quality. Yeah, so it's safe. Absolutely, yeah. And and I think as you know, like for, for medications, there's a WHO pre-qualification process and so on, which could be hopefully also utilized yeah. similarly as well for um, for the products to make sure that they're high quality and safe. Yeah, agreed. I mean, we saw what happened in a big plant here in, in the United States. Uh, you know, sloppy. I mean, it's not it's not just there that mistakes happen right here in Baltimore or whatever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Washington DC where um, again that sloppy work in a in a in a in a in a firm that had done vaccine production before so we have to be careful. Thank you. Um, I, I really hope we can move away from being kind of penny wise and uh, pound mm -hmm. foolish with this uh, effort. So to, uh, I think we have time for kind of one um, more topic today. And uh, this one is a, a little bit different from what we've been talking about so far. Um, in the Q&A we have from Tara Ahi, uh, after 9-11, there was a massive effort put towards counterterrorism. I'm curious about the policies that the federal government may adopt when it comes to disease surveillance in order to prevent something like this from happening again. Do you think there will be more of an investment in global health security and what would that look like? Um, and there's also a, a follow-up comment from Jack Rosenfield. Since the, or um, uh, yeah, it's a comment. Uh, since the Chinese are using their vaccine as a foreign policy instrument, shouldn't we do the same? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll talk about, um, I was talking to a colleague of mine, I kept um, uh, in, in a country in Africa who said, you know, that they just received a million doses from from China and he said, and that's not going to be forgotten. And that's a very telling statement. I mean, that uh, uh, it's um, such, in, such help in moments like this will not be forgotten by these countries. So I think we are, we need to keep that in mind if we, um, as we move forward, um, is that there, there could be some long lasting uh, ramifications for um, uh, uh, politically for the United States and um, in, in for, uh, for not stepping up in this moment of need, you know, versus other, versus China, for example, in, in this one example. And then the first question, oh, now I've forgotten, um, it was about global health security. Um, there was, a, there's been, I mean, it's, I think one of the sad uh, commentaries about, um, about uh, particularly the US performance in terms of confronting COVID-19 is uh, based on a 2019 survey that was done um, that measured, used certain metrics to measure preparedness uh, 
uh, from a global health security perspective, the US uh, ranked number one in the world as the country most prepared, most ready. Uh, and, and that was in 2019. And we can see now what happened. Um, and um, and I, I do think that um, there's been, a, there was a lot of, a lot of money uh, put into preparedness work, a lot of tabletop exercises, a lot of investments and so on um, over the years since 9-11 uh, since actually in terms of this issue of preparedness for emergencies overall, not just for um, infectious disease emergencies. And it, it, I think this requires really a, a strong effort at doing a true postmortem as to what happened here. Uh, what happened? How could we have been ranked top? Obviously, there's something wrong with the scale that was used, uh, so that needs to be revisited. Uh, but also, where did these all these investments go, and and why didn't they matter when it mattered the most? Um, I don't have the answer for this. I mean, I have colleagues here at ICAP who used to work at the Department of Health, and they say we did these tabletop exercises. We, you know, by with the CDC and with others, and in the end it just did not help. And um, so I think there are lots of lessons learned and clearly we need to understand what those lessons are. So we don't repeat, we don't just get an investment again and it doesn't help. So we need to learn from what happened. And then importantly, I think is, is, is I'm hoping that COVID-19 is shine the light on the important in, importance in investment in public health. I mean, we always, people in public health, like myself and others, we always feel that it's very hard to make the argument for public health because it's about prevention and nobody wants to, you don't really feel bad <laughs> if you've prevented from getting some terrible thing. So we always are, are struggling for how to, how to sell public health. And, and I'm kind of hopeful that one of the silver linings from this pandemic is, an investment in public health, an investment in global health security in very concrete ways, in data systems and surveillance in the public health workforce, in building better bridges between, I'm a physician as well, better bridges between the public health sector and the health sector, um, and, and the laboratory systems. And I, I'm hopeful because I feel now people in general, the lay public, have almost become public health experts. They actually can look at those fantastic figures that the New York Times says every day and they understand the Y axis and X axis and they know what RT is and R naught is. So we have a more of literacy and maybe more appreciation and uh, maybe that will be, uh, will, will, will bode well. On the other hand, I fear that once the crisis is over, we turn our attention to the next crisis. And we've done that before, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Wafa. That's sort of that's a real concern that instead of almost like taking, you know, we need to sort of hit the pause button and and really and and reflect and do that postmortem that you were talking about as to sort of, you know, what what went well, what went wrong, and what do we need to invest in in a certain level of kind of constant preparedness, which and you know, and preparedness in order to sort of be equipped to kind of to to do disease detection and monitoring and surveillance and sort of an, and um, and you know and prevent kind of you know rise of certain drug resistant pathogens, mm -hmm. etc. Um, which is um, which is which is expensive, but it's a such a necessary investment. And I'm and I'm I'm and I'm also sort of hoping that you know we need to kind of inspire, and I think we have inspired kind of a young generation of of um, mm -hmm. of scientists, public health, um, uh, you know, sort of and uh, public health indiv individuals who would go into public health and and advocacy and and economics, etc., to sort of kind of recognize the importance of this and make sort of know that this is. This is an important investment. I also think sort of here is where that, that public-private partnership can and, sh and and needs to be sort of capitalized upon because I think it's um, it's an expensive undertaking um, and it needs a lot of resources, not just financially but also kind of human resources. So um, I unfortunately I we're um, about to hit seven fifteen on the dot, and I think actually it it might. Uh, cut us off. <laughs> so I didn't want it to cut you off mid sentence. Um, but the I mean, those all of those points are, are really well taken. So I, I just want to, on behalf of the audience, I want to thank all of our wonderful speakers for, for joining and, and sharing their insights on this uh, critical time in the vaccine uh, vaccination campaign. So thank you so much.
And thank you, thank you, Ashley, for, for moderating this wonderful discussion, an important discussion. And thank you, thank you to all the panelists for, for doing this. It was really uh, an important and insightful event for, for me and I'm sure for many others. So thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege. Thank you. And learned we, a lot. And we need everybody's push to get where we want to get to. So thank you.